Welcome to the fourth annual Guild of Music Supervisors Conference. All right, well, well welcome. I just uh, found out I'm the moderator, so we'll, we'll wing it. Um, <laughs> Uh, we are going to be talking today about uh, how to get hired as a composer. Um, John and I have been doing film and TV music for a lot of years between us. We both are senior vice presidents at Fox, um, and we've been on both sides. We've been independent music supervisors. We've been in-house. Uh, we have a lot of long-running, long-standing relationships with directors, producers, <laughs> So, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of angles um, that we're going to kind of touch on uh, today. Um, for those of you who don't know John, a couple fun facts about John uh, that he wrote out for me here. Uh, oh, John, the, the one, one and done season uh, TV series, El Matador. You might recognize That's his one work of my good from, credits. from that. That's one uh, of my top credits. For all you film historians, uh, you might have enjoyed his work on Tom Green's epic Freddy Got Fingered. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, we won the Razzie for that one. You know, not everyone can work with uh, the Olsen twins. John has. Uh, and uh, in New York Minute, he's a Mary Kate and Ashley. Well seasoned. We're, we're, Fella over there. So I'm going to go over some of Patrick's credit highlights. <laughs> oh, boy. I was uh, struck by the importance of the Charlie's Angels unauthorized telefilm this for VH1. Was, that was, a, that was, that was an excellent one. one. Proud moment. Your work on Mr. Popper's Penguins uh, chokes me up every time just bringing up the title. It was so salient and so emotional and so uh, lasting. Heartfelt I think moments that's, in that That's one, a John. lasting one. Um, and then, of course, the... Um, Little animals that went crazy in furry vengeance. That was a big uh, comedy, a big family comedy. I just want to make clear that was not a porno film. It, yeah. was a, it was a family film. Yes. So, anyway, well, we've been, we've been in the game a, a very long time. And I always am fascinated on how composers get hired. You know, this title of this panel exactly how composers get hired is provocative whatever because it's an unanswerable question you know it's a phenomena but i feel like we're like dustin hoffman in that virus movie where i'm tracking the phenomenon trying to identify parts of the of the virus and the dna that that you might be able to pull something out of um just before we really get going even though i'm utterly blinded by these lights i, I can't i think people are out there how many composers are here who's who's a composer Oh shit, Pat! We need to, uh, uh, Dave, we need to come with some yeah. solid info, okay? Uh, yeah. Um, so, great. Well, we're going to get into to all aspects. We're going to try to stay out of the like first world problems of of uh, John Williams, uh, you know, ups and downs, uh, you know, through the process, uh, and whether uh, John Powell should take one point seven five million or take one point five million for his creative fee on that particular thing, and we're gonna, you know, we're, we have to touch upon that because it's part of the uh, part of the bigger game, and then uh, very very importantly, after we go through a, this kind of quick PowerPoint, um, just as a launching point on a, a lot of subjects. We're going to bring out composer Jeff Cardoni, who we have done several projects with each different, differently and, and sometimes together. And he's just an incredible composer who has broken through and, and he's got some some stories of, of, his, of his TV breakthrough, of his film breakthrough. And we're going to kind of chop it up uh, with with Jeff and then we'll do you know, a Q&A uh, after that. So I think we'll kind of get into this PowerPoint thing. We'll go to the second slide. So these, these are the like 11, 10 or 11 macro factors. Some, you know, seem obvious, but I, but I want to get into it. So the credit game, right? Obviously, it's the catch-22. You can't get film without a cer certain amount of credits at a level for those filmmakers who are hiring, but you can't get hired without those credits. So that's like the age-old, you know, chicken and egg. How do you accomplish that? Um, and I think depending on the lay of the land of the filmmakers, I just started a a movie with uh, director Scott Cooper, who did Crazy Hard and, and um, Hostiles um, recently, and Guillermo del Toro is the producer, and, and Miles Dale is an Oscar-winning producer, co-producer. So 
Scott's, you know, looking for a young next person, big name, Buzz, Buzz, last credit. Guillermo's like our artiste thing. Miles is like our money man. And then we have, you know, the, the studio people who will weigh in. So we're trying to find candidates that, that thread that needle. So that's where the credit game comes in, where um, there are, we, we usually, if a composer, a director doesn't have that go-to composer, um, then it's kind of, which is more, it's rare these days. But in this case, Scott looks for a specialist in every movie. The gate's pretty wide open. So we do our diligence. We, we do our own brainstorming. We use the internet. We think about related films. We think about related scores that would really work. We start getting our, our list together. And then we do our diligence and we call every agent in town and get their pitches. Probably 85% of the composers pitched to us will not even get submitted. It won't get through us and search like to get to the, the filmmakers because of the credit gate, you know? So that, that's really hard. And, and it's interesting where I, I want to talk maybe more at length about um, female composers and, and, the, and the future of that. But on the Fox lot, there was this seminar coming up. It's about gender bias. And, and I was thinking, I, I'm sure I have some unconscious level of whatever, but, but I, I try not to on, this, on the conscious level. But gender bias, it's, it's, it's like I have a credit bias. You know, I'm kind of like I can't put someone forward if they're not at the level, you know, of, of certain films where Guillermo del Toro would be like, why am I reading this land? Why am I listening to this? Whatever. You just can't um, on, on, on certain, certain ones with, with people who are – at a certain credit level, credit level themselves. So there's a big, a big part of the credit game. Hence, that's why so many of the same composers keep getting hired over and over and over again, even when they can't physically do all the work and then they team up and, and uh, have, a, have a team behind and they're just out getting the gigs and no way you know, a person can score five movies in a year and, and, and do a quality job. Yeah, so, and, and to that point, and to, I think we're going to jump back and forth between uh, some of these points and topics, but we we also have uh, a list here, 10 mistakes that composers make. And, and before we move on from the credit game, uh, number one on the list here is, a, is something good to touch on, what, which is too much metadata on your score cue, cue reels don't uh, really reveal what your score is. So it's a tough thing. Like I, I, would, I would say you're probably better off just clean audio tracks. Let the music do the talking. Because of that sort of credit bias that you could uh, come up against, you know, you can have a, an incredible cue from a project that you're pitching to a producer who might have something against that project for whatever reason. That movie he's, sucked. This person's he's wrong. Not, he's not going to be able to hear your music in the same way. So it's yeah. Once I took the metadata off of a track Christoph Beck sent me and. Um, it was from American Pie, three, American Wedding. And I gave it to the filmmakers. I put it in the temp of a Charlotte's Web remake with Dakota Fanning. And it was when um, Charlotte the Spider died. And it was the saddest thing. And the cue from American Wedding made everybody weep. It was like so gorgeous and beautiful. If they had, uh, they're like, what's that from? What is that from? I'm like, uh, playing dumb. I don't know. It's Chris Beck, track eight. No, I don't know. And I knew it was from American Wedding. But if I said that, they would have said, take it out of our feature film you know take it out of our artful thing so it's you can let the music speak more for itself and i'm sure most of your cues have provocative titles and that and tells about the vibe of of what they're going to hear but just let them hear it in a vacuum and, and kind of get swept away by without wondering if it was from uh this is us tv series or something like that where a film director snob might ding you you know um so that was one of the temas you're not powerful on that so yeah, so the credit game is something that everybody's keenly aware of. So, so we don't have to go in that into too to, to, to much detail. Number two on the thing is, is coming up the ranks. I would say that for major studio films, for major um, EA sports titles, for, for the biggest uh, network buzz shows, I always say coming up the ranks is the better way to go. For a composer to... Be at five scoring sessions at Fox that we do as the, you know, we see the importance of that right-hand person. We see them raising their hand and buzzing the, the, the composer up on the podium if they do conduct to, to give that fix and whatever. And we say, oh, my gosh, it's time, you know, Leo could really do his own film. And it's that comfort value. I, I personally think, even though it's 
torturous and you have to kind of go work for somebody slash with somebody count up the ranks in my opinion is much more effective than um scoring 20 sundance films and and, and things like that where it just doesn't get you in the game you know with at, at the major studio level at the this is our buzz new tv drama for abc and and uh, those those credits even though they might have gotten an award you know at, at uh, chicago film fest don't, don't matter as much as oh he was the person who helped so and so you know on all those movies and then also the utterly gracious composers the cool ones like uh, christoph beck we he was kind of half too busy for this movie called let's be cops and we said well how about jake we love jake because you know uh, jake uh, was his right hand person for a long time and it's music by Christoph Beck and, and, and Jake, you know, and, and that was, that just happened with a movie with Mar I did with Marco Beltrami and Brandon Roberts. And, um, you know, Brandon's obviously on his way to being music by Brandon Roberts. Um, but, but Marco he came up the ranks, you know, he had our confidence, my boss's boss's boss, you know, and Stacy Snyder running the studio says, all right, Marco Beltrami's on this. Great. But we all knew those of us working on it, that, that, you know, they were going to collaborate and Brandon was going to be our, our day to day. So coming up the ranks with a gracious boss can give you that that breakout. Yeah, title. And there, there is a lot of patience in that game as well. You know, I mean, because it is I think it's it, it's if if you're attached to someone who can get you in, in a, a bigger room meeting sort of higher level executives or producers or directors, it's going to take a couple films, a couple times, like where you really start to form those relationships and uh, by being in that room. And it is like, like, you know, your example of Jake, like Jake, I think, worked for Chris for probably four or five years before he really broke out on his on his own. And he's doing a lot of studio films on his own. But and Chris Landrum, Chris was kind of like. Why are you here still? You're too yeah. good to get going. Yeah, man. but it's it's uh, also yeah. you get if it's truly top top name uh composers you're you're in uh london and then after the abbey road session you're at that dinner with with uh our boss daniel diego head of fox music and whatever and it's just this comfort value thing comes so when it's time to go down because when a score is a disaster it's really really difficult for the music department it's um we we get a lot of uh, grief from the production department and and, and it's just an all-consuming all-hands-on-deck problem when when uh, the filmmakers lose confidence in the score and it goes wrong so anyway having coming up the ranks and having that familiar you know having someone like danielle dago be able to say i believe in this person because they know him they've seen him in action so i think coming up the ranks is the most powerful way in this thing where the hierarchy of the Hans zimmers and everybody else it's a very fixed hierarchy people literally have to die on the job or something you know for for the thing to go up um and I remember I tell a lot of young composers at 30, 35, I'm like, you're like a baby in the game, you know? Um, so all right, coming up the run. So let's go to uh, number three. Number three is sexy foreigner syndrome. Okay. <laughs> I've seen this one for decades where you get the guy comes in, you know, he's done some movies we, we, movies we never heard of in, in, in France or, or Hungary or something like that. And He's been able to get the buzz, or he's the composer for the Finnish uh, Oscar nominee this year, or whatever. He's got his shot. He comes over and I'm in with filmmakers, and this uh, this composer will say, uh, "Just uh, take the music, uh, the, put the music uh, at the beginning. Okay, we put the music, and then the middle, I put the music in the middle, and then uh -huh. the, I put the music at the end." And the filmmakers are like, "He's a fucking genius. This guy's a fucking genius." <laughs> And he, uh, he definitely has an exotic name and, and uh, you know, it's, it's just, you could literally do like an undercover boss, a test case and <laughs> come up with a cra craze, crazy foreign name, come over with a fanny pack and a whole story and, and get a major studio film if, if you did it right. <laughs> so, so anyway, so th those people, but it's it, uh, on the flow, on the roadmap of how it all works, those, those people are always sort of coming in side, mid, side mid, door, mid, yeah. uh, mid pyramid of the, of the hierarchy. But, but I've seen that one, uh, seen that one a lot. Uh, the next one, number four, Pat, loyalty. Loyalty, and we're going to talk about loyalty cutting both ways, you know. Um, loyalty is obviously when a director is loyal to a composer. Sometimes they have the juice to carry that 
person forward to the first Warner Brothers movie. Um, sometimes they, they don't. Um, sometimes they have the coolness to fight, really fight and do it. And, and sometimes they are incredibly disloyal and um, kind of leave, leave their, their person behind. And that's, I've seen that and that's really, really tragic. Um, but loyalty doesn't always work just because a director wants to, especially a young director coming in the studio system. They, they might have a very strong producer. That producer says, we must hire John Powell. They're, you know, they're saying, you know, you, well, I want you to hire my guy who nobody ever heard of. Um, and then he's got a fight and they fight over, it's horse trading. All right, you get your cinematographer. I get my this, you know, whatever. And they crew up. And then sometimes the director doesn't have the juice left to, to get their composer on board. And that's a really bummer of a, of a situation. But I've also seen directors who can't get somebody on or leave them behind, circle back. And then two studios later, the person who did, did the hard work on those, those indie films for them does get back in the fold. And their director will tell them that you know, such and such blue chip composer isn't all that cracked up to be. And I was fighting for time and attention and, and I didn't love the final product. So um, loyalties, um, you know, a tricky one, but... Um, there's, there's also, I mean, probably a, a great recent example of it working is Ludwig Gorson, who he and the director, uh, they were schoolmates, did school projects, went on to, to talk their way into uh, getting Creed, but then cut to Black Panther, uh, and, and you know, they're just massive success, and you'll never be able to wedge through those guys. And, and yeah. Look at that name, Ludwig. Okay, and and he's right. <laughs> refer back to sexy foreign. He he, he he rocks a ponytail. He looks like Bjorn Borg. He wears like fuzzy uh, suits and stuff. And um, I think he's from Columbus, Ohio, or something. I want to I want a background check on that guy. You know, um, but uh, but yeah, loyalty works. And then sometimes it's always like anything, even on the smaller levels, even on the on the breaking through levels, even on the you know getting up to the Sundance thing. It's like one thing leads to another. Uh, guy, I composer, I work with a lot, Tyler Bates. We, he was really on the fence, and and I was like begging him to get on John Wick One with me, and I had no idea, like you know, that it would would be a successful film. But not only that, it became its own franchise, and so Tyler did is on John Wick Three there. There was co-directors. The other director blew up and did um, Atomic Blonde, which Tyler scored. And then that same director, David Leach, the other one did um, Deadpool 2. So Tyler, like, was on the fence about a low-paying, sketchy, dodgy indie thing. You know, we believed in Keanu and we liked the energy of these young, you know, they weren't even, like, young, young directors, but it was their first time. And that was, like, one thing about them. They are extremely loyal. When David Leach goes into Universal he, and uh, he's doing a... Uh, sequel in the franchise, like a spin-off of Fast and Furious 8. And... He came in, he said, I only, only will do this movie if I can hire my key crew. I want my DP, I want my this, I want my editor, or whatever. And Tyler Bates is the composer. And they just said, yes. You know, so that one thing that Tyler, you know, he was really on the fence about John Wick 1 has led to this amazing, you know, blossoming. And, and, and that's the loyalty effect. And, and that's super lucky. I mean, I think with two directors going out and both blowing up at the same time, it's kind of, kind of lucky. But, but that helps you. And, and, and Tyler's no young baby in the game you know he was he was working for 10 15 years before he really got his his breakthrough so that's loyalty so number five patty temp track hero why don't you talk about maybe talk about the ridley scott story i mean yeah they're uh make friends with music editors and picture editors and and, not even make friends mass mailing get your agents to get your stuff to them get your your music to them and it's uh a really powerful thing when a cue is working in a temp score very early on. And um, uh, I've worked with Ridley Scott on a bunch of films, and, and, and recently we just did Alien Covenant together. And, um, you know, Ridley has a handful of composers that he, he's worked with throughout the years, you know, not a, a, a very wide range. And he was um, really trying to figure out the tone of the score and, and um, there was a handful of cues from a, a, a composer named Jed Kurzel, who had, had maybe three, four film credits to his name that all matched with his brother, who was the director, not even an L.A.-based guy. But um, as Ridley was really trying to drill down and find the tone of the film, he kept saying to his picture editor, what is that, what is that cue? What is that cue? 
and they, you know, figured out who it was, and and we tracked down Jed Kurzel, and we flew him to France for a meeting, and next thing you know, he's hired on a Ridley Scott, you know, major franchise but film. The uh, funny thing about that to me is, Ridley quote said, "This guy gets my movie." Yeah. Now, Jed probably would have laid a fart if he scored to Ridley's picture, you know, and, and, and like, he did, it was dumb luck, you know, he had some richness and some things that Ridley responded to, but how can he get the movie when he hasn't seen the movie? He hasn't seen the scene and it, the temp was just crafted in there and worked, you know, but uh, he did come through and it was a great yeah. score, you know, and all that stuff. But it was kind of interesting how it just won the day and that, that temp, temp music track. So we got to pick up the pace, Patty. Um, so we're, in, we're at our, our, our Irish Speed bar rounds. pace here. Speed rounds. Number six, writing on spec. Writing on spec is a tr slippery slope. It's tricky. Um, I just actually had a, ma uh, like, not a major, like a major Spanish composer refused to write on spec to a script where the, the director's like, I really answer, but could you, you know, I'll send you the script. You've read the script. You need to send me something. And he wisely said, said no. He goes, I'll write the picture. That's what I do. I'm a film composer. I'll write, I'll score the picture, but I'm not going to write to the script because he's found that that, that kind of hasn't worked out. But on the other hand, you know, it can, it can save you. And then also, I did six or eight movies with Chris Beck, so, so to go back to him one more time, on his very first movie I got him hired on, when I told him what the, the vibe of the thing was and what temp was working, he didn't have the cue. And he goes, just give me till Monday, it was a Friday. So then when I get his reel on the Monday, it had a killer cue with like a, uh, exotic instrumentation and this thing and all this and it was perfect and he wrote it on spec over the weekend so they heard that and like oh my god this guy could be great and then his other stuff carried more weight but if he didn't have that it would have been like nah next you know so writing on spec can work in some situations um number seven we've kind of talked about this one which is the indie breakthrough like that that buzz you know hey you just did little miss sunshine or you know whatever but but I put the odds at one in 500. You have to do 500 indie films to have one be like the buzz film that, that everybody talks about and, and gets, you, gets you the gigs. And that does happen. Like John Murphy, Locked, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. Not that well, it was it kind of a cool, badass movie. It was um, and not traditional scored at all, but like all the coolest, trendiest directors liked it. So um, it kind of, he was like the name on the, on the lips of, of uh, all the cutting edge filmmakers. So you could still have your indie breakthrough and, and it should be pursued, but just know with one in 500, according to my slightly pessimistic estimate of it, I would, I would go back to number two of, of coming up the ranks, but that's just me. Um, maybe too conservative way to look at it, but um, and then number nine, the, the handoff. The handoff is just when Marco Beltrami finishes a movie for a major studio. The, they're ecstatic about it. And the film studio chairman who never gets involved with score or whatever is like, God, I love that score. Get Marco on something. So all of a sudden it's just, it's done. And then there's some formalities where they put us in. We have to bring Marco and we meet with the director and the director almost kind of thinks they have a choice on it, you know, and, and it was just kind of going through the motion, but the fix is in like Marco's yeah. doing that movie, you know. So um, a lot of a lot of studios get paranoid of xenophobia, fear of outsiders. So once you uh, like Junkie XL, Tom Holcomberg, who we work with a lot. And, and even as supervisors, I found this, you know, you have one success at a studio, all of a sudden you look at their resume, they did five in a row for Warner Brothers. And, and that exactly happened to, to Tom. He was there, they were high-fiving, they were just clinking, clinking champagne at the, at, the, uh, at the mix, and then he was on their next one the next day. So I would say the top, you know, 20 to 30% of, of all the, the composer hires in the film and the top TV realms are, are just handoffs where it's not even on the open market. It never will be. It's a fix. So... Um, and number, number 10, 10. Uh, which should be number one yeah but you'd think it would be number one but great music and great production value yeah i mean there you know there's a lot especially tv for this one yeah and there's a lot of this that that goes back through some of the points we've already made i mean it is it's that 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 you know the temp score game of if you have cues out there, you know that are, are great sounding and can find their way into temps. It's a way to get you noticed. I mean, there's it's also, you know, there's there's a little bit of a trick to all of this because, you know, I always say it, it, it's you know uh, 
give them what they they need, not what they want. You know, there there is a process that every filmmaker goes into a, a project where they're going to do that completely unique thing. They, you know, it, our score has never been like, written before. Never written it doesn't exist yeah, out doesn't there exist anywhere. Right? You get hired as a composer. You get in there and you start to do that, and then the wheels start coming off the bus because it maybe you don't test well in a preview and studio executives get nervous and they all start going back more towards a traditional model. But when you have a reel or when you are handing stuff off in, into a temp score, some of those bolder choices, some of those things will turn ahead and have someone dive down to say, whose music is that? And that's the case of Jed Kurzel and it, it parlays into something bigger, but it's... Yeah, and if it's... If it's something that might seem kind of normal to you, as long as it's really done, great production value, tastefully, whatever, it's okay to have like normal score because a lot of the producers and people listening to your reel want comfort. Like, oh, I hear some real score. That sounds like cinematic score where if you have four tracks and it's your loop things of uh, glass things and you tapped on the bottom of the Eiffel Tower and echoed it out and built it all in, they just might be like, whoa, I don't know about this, you know, but you can get there, you know, you can get the gig and then go, go towards yeah. that. Um, but music, sadly, is 10th where it should be first or second. Uh, number 11. I know nothing about this, Patrick yeah. Houlihan. Do you know? I, Let me is, tell you the story know, of John Houlihan. I see it. When I look at the Houlihans all across town, I don't even know what this means. The practice among those with power or influence of favoring relatives or friends, especially by giving them jobs. So certain directors that come across our radar, we're like, does the husband or the wife score films? Does yeah. is there a cousin in the mix? Is there a brother in the mix or whatever? Because that it will swing back to loyalty, and and th those people will will get the shot. There's there's obviously a lot of nepotism in any business, but particularly in in this town. And I I put the whole bottom thing of the synonyms because it was sort of poignant. Not only favoritism, preference treatment, the old boy network. That is uh, more uh, appropriate in film scoring. With the, it doesn't say the women's film music board network, you know, because that's like what's trying to change things. And a lot of people from within, Chris Beck has this wonderful seven million, uh, seven figure million dollar program to get, get uh, female composers and 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 uh, uh, diversity uh, amongst. So there's there's a lot going on with that and um if there's more success on the production side with inclusion waivers that's going to really help that's something that's kind of bubbling bubbling around um and i think when there are very strong female filmmakers or you better believe when a script is being made because of sandra bullock she's going to go inclusion waiver and there's going to have to be better percentages and i think there's going to be a lot more doors opening for for female composers and and people of color so um, because yeah, the, the, the old boy network of, of film composing and, and, uh, you know, you look at the, the board probably at the uh, Academy uh, of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences, and it probably looks like literally like Ben Franklin, George Washington, you know, like says nothing but like old white guys in there. So we're all trying to, to change that. Um, so that's sort of just like kind of 11 like springboard points. We're going to fly. We're going to get let, let's get Jeff up here and then we'll talk about this. The, the other nine on the things not to do. So here comes Mr. Jeff, Jeff Cardoni. I need this. So why don't you put. Okay. So I, I, I screwed up everything on this list. Oh, yeah. You done it. <laughs> Did it backwards. I would say you didn't, though, because no, well, I have Jeff's full credits here. It's a pretty heavy document, you know? This is like. <laughs> it's almost you're killing, you're killing trees. It's almost 500, so I'm waiting for the. Uh, trees the in the Amazon, you know? But let me just, uh, for those who don't know you, let me just fly through your, your bio really quick. Um, over 45 feature film scores and several network series to his credit. Mulganier Jeff Cardone's work worldwide every day. Jeff originally studied classical piano. Uh, while playing percussion in the school orchestra, but it would be rock and roll that would lead him to Los Angeles. After a brief stint as lead guitarist in the Warner Brothers band Alien Crime Syndicate, Jeff left to pursue film scoring full-time. He worked under several composers, including John Murphy, you know, who's most of you know here, Snatch 28 Days Later, etc. Um, and while studying conducting and orchestration at UCLA, uh, he, he brushed up that side of his jobs. His body of work ranges from 
Studio features like Fox's Mike and Dave Need Wedding Dates, which we all worked on and laughed our heads off through the whole process was fun. Uh, Step Up, All In, Just Friends, which, which Patrick and Jeff did together years ago. Independent films like The Confirmation from Oscar-nominated Bob Nelson, Nebraska. Um, television scores like um, Mike Judge's comedy um, Silicon Valley for HBO, which is really a steam score. Training Day, which Jeff and I worked on for a year before we unfortunately lost uh, Bill Paxton, uh, passed away. Um, and uh, CBS's highest rated comedy of the year, Young Sheldon for Chuck Lorre. So he also done... Um, CSI Miami was his breakthrough, which we're going to talk about in a moment, um, as well as uh, The League, MTV's Pimp My Ride, Long Road Home, um, and uh, which was Gene Simmons from Kiss. And he's also done advertising, Lexus spots, and, and the stuff. He collaborates um, with the Pixies uh, on that. So um, anyway, Mr. Jeff Cardone. So Hi, guys. So, how do you do it? Jeff? How do you do it? But I, I wanted to learn. That's why I came. <laughs> but do you actually think you're doing it? I mean, the system almost like psychologically, it's almost like praise be, you know, like uh, the Handmaid's Tale to you know keep composers down. But yeah, you know, that's a good. I, I don't know. I, I to some you would think you're probably doing it. To myself, I think that I'm not there yet. You know, uh, I've I've learned to kind of. Uh, Appreciate the moment a little bit instead of being pissed off every day that I'm not somewhere. You know what I mean? Like we all, right. you know what I mean? Uh, you know, I, I I love doing films and I, I, you know, but it's hard. Like a lot of things you said, I can I can speak to every one of those points and how it directly affected me, uh, for for better or for worse. You know. Uh, yeah, and it's frustrating in films it's just because the budget's low doesn't mean composers have a shot. My lowest budget movie I'm working on right now is about $14 million, and we have this young upstart kid named Thomas Newman doing the score. You know, So Tom is coming down to do movies of that scope. Right. It's, it's Where do you get it? Well, it feels like when, since I got in the game, you know, which is 15 years ago, more than that now, uh, it, it really changed. Like when I first got here to be a composer, it was like composers weren't popular. You know what I mean? Like it was like composer was it was a it was a skill. It was you had to be an orchestral composer. You had to be a legit composer. You know, there were the rock people and then there were the legit composers. And you know, so I really tried to, which is why I went and did conducting and all that stuff, is because I really thought that's what you needed to succeed as a composer. And and you know, and over fifteen years, it's really changed a lot. Where it's kind of wide open to everything now. You know, nobody cares what skills, you know, I mean, some things want just a hip young DJ, you know, or it, it's right. like it's wide open. And since there's so much stuff now with TV and streaming and film, it's like the hierarchy is all, you know, again, when I started, it was like film was film. And the guys who were doing films weren't doing anything else. And TV was that. And independent film was that. And you couldn't cross over, cross. yeah. But now, yeah, like I'll submit a demo on something, and it's it's the wild west. Like you it's getting really, better. Yeah, the Netflix is going to likely get nominated for the first Oscar for yeah. this, this year, and they have a really good shot. But you're everyone's competing against everyone for everything, you know. Like Mark Isham is doing God knows how many TV shows, you know. And like when I started, he was feature film only. So it's yeah. you know the whole. It, it's 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 interesting because it's wide open for anything, but it's it's. Trying to find what your path is is really difficult. I want to quickly talk about your breakthrough in television, which was getting hired on CSI Miami. And the great thing about that was something that doesn't happen too much. I've maybe done three of them uh, in uh, 120 movies, but it's called the Bake Off. You know, it's a blind taste test where we have a short, short set of composers, and everybody writes something on spec. The director and the producer get here's composer A. B, your C, your D, they have no idea who's who's who. So you got that opportunity for CSI Miami, right? Uh, yeah, which was, yeah, I was, to, to get to there, like I was pretty much two weeks away from leaving town because <laughs> I had been here and it's just, it was really hard to get something going on. And I had uh, a friend of mine, uh, mutual, uh, music supervisor Jason Alexander and Rudy Chung, they had an a office in Santa Monica. And they said, we have a studio that opened up next to us. You should rent the studio because there's some cool stuff going on. 
And I was living in West Hollywood and fully broke. And I didn't know how to do it, but I like maxed out credit cards and got this studio for six months. Uh, and I would take the bus from West Hollywood to Santa Monica to the studio. Uh, and, uh, and like in the first couple months there, someone came in on a Friday night and said, can you do a short film? Uh, so Danny Cannon, the director of CSI asked me to do a short film. Uh, and I did it. I didn't, you know, didn't think anything of it. So then flash forward a few months later, they came in on a Friday night and said, Hey, Graham Ravel is a composer on CSI Miami. They were going to let Graham go and they were going to have some guys demo. And they asked me if I wanted to demo, which I was like, there's no way they're going to go from Graham Ravel to me. You know, I mean, Graham was a less film dude, but, but they did. So they sent it home and I know someone from Hans's place did it. And I know there are a few other people and uh, but I had nothing to do. So I did a whole episode and yeah, they watched it. They watched them with no names on it. And I got called because of that. Like, that's never happened since, but it was a life changing thing. <laughs> it should almost be like the way it should work. Not the extra, yeah. not with the free work part so much. Maybe everybody yeah. gets 15 grand. Well, well, and then once they picked me, then Danny kind of backed me up and Jason, they kind of vouched for me, you know, because right. it was still a fight. They're like, we want the guy from Hans's camp number B. They're like, yeah. that's Jeff Cardoni. Right. Oh. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, wow. Yeah. What do we do about the Cardoni problem? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no. So they tried to kill me off, but it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's wild like that, though. How it just, it, it, someone could have had, you know, the wrong cup of coffee yeah. or the watch it, listened on an iPhone or whatever, but it, you, you threaded the needle and you got, got that. Yeah, yeah, and we all get lucky. And it's just to get lucky, you just have to, you just have to do everything and anything that comes your way, you know? And it's like, we all have different paths and meet different people. And, you know, if I can go back, yeah, I should have gotten coffee for Hans when I started because it might have been an easier path. But, you know, we all have stuff come into our lives for whatever reason, and that's what presented itself to me. And I'm glad that I did that short film for nothing and wasted a weekend doing a show. It probably would have been nothing because it really changed your life. So I think you really have to be open to doing everything you can to move the needle. Uh, even if something you think you're doing doesn't work out, it might lead to something else. And once you got the gig, I would imagine you were on double secret probation and you deliver a few episodes with like, how's the score? Is this guy doing it for us? Right, yeah, it, it, was, it was scary, but, um, but that worked out. And then that, lead, that led me to finally working with you a few years later. Well, that's, I mean, and, and, you know, back to the idea of hopefully, you know, the music speaks for itself in the moment and, and you know, not being too selective about some of the projects that you start on because they may not be the best TV shows are the best films, but the music takeaway in an audio listen can be powerful. I mean, one of my favorite early cues of yours was he, Jeff and I did a film called Firehouse Dog, which was just a, a family film for New Regency. And it's a fine film, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. My kids have all enjoyed yeah. it as they grew up, but like that's always cue two or cue number three on any reel I put together, like when right. I'm submitting your name in. And, right. and it is it like if, you take off firehouse dogs so no one goes, well, right. bring me the guy who did firehouse dog. Right. But right. they hear the cue and they go, they hear the composition and they hear the complexity and the emotion that comes through in that, that certain track. I mean, when we scored that cue, the orchestra didn't know what the film was about. Yeah. And they, they were first break. They're like, Oh, really excited to know what, what the, uh, the right. movie was. And we we're like, it's a firehouse yeah. dog. So these firemen, uh, adopt a dog, you know, the shenanigans. And then they're like, what are you talking about? I'd be shocked if the dog yeah. went into a fire and saved anybody. Right. That didn't happen. Did <laughs> or that was the cue. Right? But, but, you, but you don't know, like to me, that was the biggest movie in the world at the time. And I treated it like that, you know, I mean, it was like 80 minutes of full orchestral and, you don't know when you're, you know, and that was a studio movie and studio movies are hard to get. So seeing John's 10 list, it's, it's hard. So for me, that was a huge get to get that movie. And I treated it like that. And it was like, I treated it like it was an Oscar worthy. And I was super proud of the score. And you just don't know what's going to happen when they come out. You and you know? still have clients from it, right? Because you, you're trying to please the studio, Sometimes the director, well, whatever. Loyalty, uh, Todd, right? Todd. Loyalty. Yeah. <laughs> Director is not loyal on that. <laughs> but but uh, the critic <laughs> coming wasn't, up. The, wasn't Todd Holland loyal? loyal? No, he didn't I did. Him. Well, I did a couple other shows for him, but not as loyal as I would have thought. But he hasn't directed movies. Yeah, you just don't know what's going to happen. Right. Uh, he hasn't directed another studio film, so 
I see the 15 minutes. Oh, there's 15 minutes? Okay. Well, I'll tell you what 10. we're going to do. Uh, I'm going to fly through this 10 mistakes, which is arrogant of us to sit up here and say, here are the mistakes you make. But um, we'll, we'll read this through because hopefully it's more like 10 helpful hints, I would call I would rename this. Um, mistake, don't allow your agency to make the submission real. You don't want somebody, the, this intern guy in, you don't want someone to think, oh, this movie's kind of like this other horror movie, so we're just going to use that reel and repurpose it. You know, you really have to take control and do your own submission reels for quality I, control. I can vouch for that, too. Like, I, I do all my own reels, and I'll, I write the first track, and I, uh, I've i gotten more movies than I should because I wrote the first track. That's yeah. step up I got because I wrote the track. And when I really think a composer's right, and it's somebody I know well, I'll take the reel that the agency submitted, I'll take off three things, I'll put in three or four of my own favorite things from my own reel, and just put it in that way. Um, this is a minor, minor one, and it's mo more for the early, early days of getting in the game. But I think it's a mistake to sell yourself as a jack of all trades musically. Like filmmakers and, and TV show owners, they don't want a person who can do banjo, uh, you know, and classical. You know, they they're looking for an expert at something. They want, you know, oh, if you want, I can do orchestra, I can do electronic. You know, I think it's best to say I'm like the dopest electronic. Uh, orchestra hybrid, you know, and that's your specialty and that's that's your thing. I think they're looking for, for experts. So anyone who sells me, I can give you punk rock, I can give you polka, whatever. Like, I'm just like, nah, that's all right. Well, but it's, all, it's also focusing it as well because I think it's important, you know, part of a collaboration that a director and producers and, and you know, a team wants is, is someone who will bring in a point of view. So if you come in and pitch yourself as like I can do anything you guys want me to. It's 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 more of a turnoff than saying I understand your film. I think it would be great if if you let me do this. You know. Yeah. You this quick side out. anecdote: We have a friend who's a composer who was a little nervous about his meeting, ripped a big bong hit or vaped a big thing in his car, and it was like he has his day weeded, his night weed. He got him mixed up, so he was like goes in there in a dark place. He told him everything that was wrong with their temp score. And everything he would do, and they walked out, and they're like, we need that guy. We're hiring that guy. Like, he got it. He got it. Um, uh, number five, uh, b being a diva. Like, it's just reputation is everything. And sometimes there'll be meetings, really early meetings, about composer brainstorming lists. And if somebody who does the billing for the orchestrators at that meeting goes, no, nah, I can't handle that person again. Let's get out, put them on the list. They burned me out last time. That was such a hassle working with them. They were rude. They were you know, this and that. So just everybody is like a, a potential person to help you you get the job big and small from studio manager up to, to everybody. So um, there's just your brand name and every, reputation is everything. And don't don't give anyone ammo to sink your battleship. And other agents, competing agents will will do like, character assassination research and they'll you know oh do you hear what happened at sony oh he went over and he screamed at them or whatever you know don't ever do that um one composer threw a fax machine at me in 1998 and uh, i haven't i haven't looked at them since so. um, that's when fax machines were expensive too i was <laughs> His name was Jeff Cardone. <laughs> uh, always mums a word on other projects. Yeah, it's great. Well, no, I'm doing the next uh, season of Silicon Valley. Starts up Thursday, but I've got time for you, whatever. Don't ever bring that up. They're, they're going to question you sometimes, whatever, but it's like letting people know you're their only thing in the world. It's a don't ask, don't tell kind of thing. Everybody multitask. Everybody's juggling multiple, multiple projects. But um, mom is the word on your other stuff uh, unless they put a gun to your head and you have to confess one-fourth of the other stuff you're working on and then get out of it. Um, not revising cues enough on change notes. Sometimes um, if a cue's not working and it comes back and it gets rejected, you can't just lower the harp part by a third and send it back. You know, mm -hmm. that, that kind of just leads to frustration with your director and your filmmaker. It's trying to show somebody digging in, hey, I think this is great. It just is like if a change note comes and, and uh, another yet another name drop of Chris Beck, but Chris Beck will say, you know what? Sometimes people don't articulate their notes right. Sometimes they articulate them dead wrong or whatever. But 
what they have de they have identified a spot and I'll take like my metal detector on the beach and I will go to that spot and I will improve that cue. And there's always a way to improve it when I go back and revisit it, but it has to be in substantial ways. If you do these little incremental changes, it's just sort of like, ah, this guy's, this person is not getting it, quote unquote. You know? So, um, failing that this is really, this is a whole panel. This is a whole day seminar unto itself, but, um, Failing to take temp score into account and failure to read what the temp score is achieving. Temp score is such a curse, but you have to look at it, and to composers see it largely as a curse, but you have to look at it as the, the, the sunny side of the street of it. it. It is a blessing as it communicates some basic things, some energy shifts, some ups, some downs, some whatever. doesn't mean you have to cop a flute line you know, when, when the car comes around the corner or whatever, but paying attention to the temp is you you know great someone said a great thing about composing which was it's like trying to catch an express train at a local stop so they've been working on something for years and years and years and the train is whizzing by you jump on that temp score is like a rosetta stone to what the director is is thinking and, and also identifying to the director is this did you like this temp is it working for you largely or do you hate it oh, i hate it disregard or no i like it it's it's important to track it no matter what a lot of People don't want to take into account, and, and it bites me in the ass. Um, there's always multitasking, so we can always tell when a composer delegated a cue to one of their team members, whatever, and it's fine. But just quality control, and don't present that. Like there's, because I've I've had uh, directors be like, "Oh my god, I can't believe you know." That's actually a Graham Reville story. I can't believe Graham did that. Thing. I'm like, I go, Graham, you didn't do that. You did you? No, it's Tommy did it. But I'm like, all right, well, do them, you know, over, over better oversight. Um, then also lastly, uh, you got to network, you got to schmooze, you got to even move next to music supervisors sometimes or whatever, you know, money to, but, 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 but the relationships, everybody's overextended and super busy. So you can't like overdo it. You, you can't touch base with someone every week and things like that. I mean, I, um, even like I have, you have 11 movies. I have like 12 or both getting three more each, you know? But there's phases when we need to hear from composers. There's phases when I'm in finishing mode on three movies right now. I can't talk to you know. So anyway, if you fall up too much, it's just sort of like that person feels like they could um, be a lot of work if you went into business with them. Cool. So yeah, lots of challenges discussed today. Sorry if I was pessimistic at all at any point, but I can say everybody could do it. Jeff Cardoni can attest Jeff that you can, can do, do it. it. Bye. 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 Bye.